that has been built in the ministry which now has a full study of agriculture and rural statistics for Fiji, of which an agricultural census was a key component of that. Ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good morning to you all. The um, Fiji country ref for you, uh, Ms. Joanne Young. Um, the Acting Prime Minister Secretary of Agriculture, uh, Director of uh, Policy, Ms. Seram Buse, the Commissioner Central, uh, senior staff from Ministry of Agriculture, Waterways, senior staff from other government departments. Ladies and gentlemen, I will have an answer to you all. I just noticed Sakusha Tumuna there, Bula Sakusha. When um, Sarah was introducing me, Sarah, come on, please, have a seat. Have a seat there, please. No, no, no. no go there, go there. Yeah. <laughs> Hope I'm not going to pull any wire off from here. When, when Sarah was introducing uh, me, I was feeling a bit mandu about all those um, social media <laughs> things of last week. But, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to uh, see you all here this morning. Um, I want to begin by thanking FAO uh, for the uh, and UN for their support in, uh, to Ministry of Agriculture in a number of projects, uh, be it uh, data collection, be it uh, development of proposals uh, uh, and uh, other projects that they have supported, uh, particularly over the last 18 months uh, when we are facing this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as alluded to by uh, Ms. Young, we have just come out of uh, the uh, uh, release of the uh, 2020 Agriculture Census Report. As you would have noted, it's a census. Census meaning that uh, it involves data on all agricultural households. <coughs> We have close to 80,000 agriculture households in Fiji, and this is the first time ever we have a comprehensive data on all agricultural households, including um, farmers. Prior to this, we had several other uh, agricultural um, uh, survey of agricultural households, but they were not census. They were a collection of a a so-called representative sample of agricultural households. So there were several problems with, with that. One, when I uh, joined ministry, I had asked that, you know, let me look at uh, the census, the survey reports. Now, there were one problem was that I couldn't compare them because uh, they involved different areas, uh, they involved uh, different regions, uh, they, I, I, I couldn't find uh, data that I could link to see what's happening to a particular area over time or what is happening to households over time. Even though I would have preferred to have time series data on households to see, you know, in a continuous, uh, with, with respect to continuous variables, what's happening to that particular variable over time for that particular household. And there's several reasons why I would want to see that data. For example, effectiveness of our policies. We have invested so much in supporting households, or let's say we provided fencing material to this particular household, farming households, about 20 years ago. I would want to know what's happening. So if we are not able to get continuous uh, uh, data, time, time series data, then this data that the survey data we have for different periods can be a proxy to see how they have done. So we couldn't do that. There's no record of the data. Secondly, you can't, uh, you, you, there's no population data. So, um, and there's no data. The only thing we have is the report. And, and the methodologies are different. And also, you don't have a detailed description of the methodology. Now, for any research, the most critical part 
is the methodology. The methodology includes the philosophical approach, the theoretical base, and the um, approach, approach to uh, data collection and the analytical framework. Right? So the methodology is the overarching, overarching framework where the researcher approached that particular problem based on a, on a philosophical foundation. Different researchers have different philosophical foundation. Uh, I don't want to go in detail about that, uh, the, this philosophical foundation, but some are a foundation from which they are more kind of qualitative, some are more quantitative, you know, so you know, in, a, in the in the deeper literature, some people say he's from a Kuhn, Kuninian paradigm. He's from a Lakatos or Popa, etc. So, it's very important that you get the methodology right, and the methodology is based on the philosophical foundation, the theoretical framework. And the theoretical framework is based on a detailed examination of the existing body of knowledge or the literature. So based on that and based on, because all the um, uh, agriculture senses are in fact a problem solving research. So you've got a problem solving research, you've got subject matter research, you've got disciplinary research. So based on the key questions Based on the problem, you have the, got the key questions. From the key questions, you generate the hypothesis, and based on that, you design your questionnaire. So the last part is, based on what is the question, what data you're after, is your questionnaire. I must say that the, the recent uh, census was a masterpiece in terms of getting the required data to answer the questions that we all have in mind. It was so comprehensive that for the first time ever, we had data on, detailed data on, uh, by gender, by sector, we had fishery sector included. Now, initially, when I looked at it, for any researcher, the Accuracy of the data is negatively correlated with the length of the questionnaire. And if you ask any researcher. So when you, so the question is, how far do you go in terms of the length of the questionnaire, meaning the time you spend with a uh, respondent, because it could compromise the quality of data you will collect. So initially, when we were discussing with Sai and the team, I was a bit concerned about that really we are agriculture ministry, how far do we go to collect data about fisheries, etc. We might jeopardize the quality of the data that we are after. Of course, there were experts involved, and they assured that uh, you know, they've done um, uh, not trials, you know, uh, and they found that you will not be, you should be okay. Because, you know, the longer you take with a the respondent, they'll get agitated, and then they start giving, okay, yeah, 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 yes, yes. Yeah, 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 20 acres, yeah, yeah. Uh, 20 tons, yeah. They just want to get away from it. So the longer you take, the, the quality of data that you will get could be compromised. Noting all those risks, we went ahead, our team, and collected a very comprehensive data. Massive investment, time, resources, technical support, etc. The question now is, we need to utilize that. Utilize it for policy making. Now, if we had, if we had similar data, or if we had time series data, we could have looked at and answered the question of whether we have structural change in the agriculture sector, the fisheries sector. Structural change in the economy 
or structural change of a sector is more permanent in nature and requires major changes to deal with the new structure. Arbitrary, seasonal, these changes are okay. Over time, definitely structural change will happen. And structural change of Fiji sex, uh, agriculture sector has happened. Major changes. And that is why you see that we are finding numerous problems to deal with as we are getting agriculture sector to expand. So it is unfortunate. So, so what is past, we can't go back in time and correct those and <laughs> go back and collect time series data from 30 years. Uh, certain variables is possible, but majority of the variables you can't. You can't go and ask someone, 1970, how much did you produce? The, the accuracy of data is questionable. Okay. So it is time we should look at establishing time series data within various ministries for key variables relevant to the ministry and longitudinal data over time and over a particular point in time like this census. Census is basically descriptive data at a particular point in time what is the situation on the ground whether it's population, whether it's agriculture, whether it's poverty. But to make solid policy interventions, you need to have a regular data gathering, and if possible, on these dimensions that I mentioned. So when, you have, when we have invested so much, we must utilize this data. We must utilize this data. Now, all of you are very critical people in the respective ministries, the commissioners, the rural maritime development ministry, agriculture, fisheries, all those frontline ministries play a very important role in mapping out the future growth and development traje trajectory of Fiji because you are supposed to advise the minister, advise the policy makers based on the most recent data. Policy making cannot be based on past data. Of course, you learn from past experience, but you need to look at what is happening on the ground and advise on new policies. Because policies, the policy making process is dynamic in nature. And for the same issue, policies are made at different periods of time because you need to make intervention. So the only way you can change a particular policy, existing policy is if the new data tells you something else. So who feeds? When I was in academia, I said that you've got teachers in primary and high school. Their job is to get a standard foundation information and data, right, stock of knowledge, and allow the students to have that foundation stock of knowledge. One plus one, you know, B for ball, and that's their job. They are teachers. They provide the foundation knowledge. So in universities, you have academics. Their job is to create new body of knowledge. Now, if you don't create new body of knowledge, then it won't feed into policy making, then societies and country will remain stagnant. The growth and development of any country, any society, is first based on the new knowledge that is created, and then second, that new knowledge should be used to expand the frontier. That is why you see these developed countries, they're growing rapidly because they have got, they spend massive amount of money on research, development, innovation, technology. 
So you have got a cadre of academics in the university. These academics are supposed to undertake research. Research and develop new knowledge, new body of knowledge. So every point in time, the existing body of knowledge in each particular area will expand. Whether well, it's research institute, Cornivia Research Station, Sugar Research Station, or universities, or research unit in Ministry of Health, or fisheries. Then you have got intellectuals. Intellectuals' job are to use that new body of knowledge and make a policy difference. To so some point in time, I said that in a university, when I was in the Ministry of Education, when I was the Education Minister, I said, Universities, you know, there are very few intellectuals. They got upset with me. They started attacking me. And he's, he's attacking academics. No, no, I didn't attack academics. What I said was, we want to see that the research you do, there's so much research undertaken by, you know, professors and, uh, at, at the university, but that research doesn't feed into policy making. Because it doesn't reach you who are the advisors of the ministers of cabinet. They are published in journals, you know, A rank journal, B rank journal, C rank journals. You no, know, I've done all those. But then, how many of those professors who publish also want to see that their findings end up in policy making? Right. You may ask me, did you do it? Yes, I did it. When you meet me over coffee, I'll give you examples of how I inter intervene in policy making. Right. So uh, it's very important that the research you do, that research ends up in policy making. Whether every policy that the cabinet approves requires research input. Recently, we took a paper to cabinet to make a change to the way we process applications uh, for uh, agricultural grants. The last time the policy paper was done was after there was this agriculture scheme. You know the agriculture scheme, the famous agriculture scheme, millions of dollars were wasted. So the cabinet decided, ask agriculture ministry, said, we, I think, we need to redo the entire process. And the process was very cumbersome. The, at the end, then the various P, uh, PSS would meet to approve. So it took nine months. It took nine months to get there. And then in the 10th month, uh, there was a scramble to get the RIAs to Ministry of Economy to get it processed. Paula knows very well he was there. And 10th, 11th month, by the time the economy, all the money is gone. They start, start putting, you know, stock to disbursement because, you know, cash flow issues and all those, budget is about to close. So, based on uh, the feedback, based on experience, based on finding, based on the data, we did a cabinet paper, took to the cabinet, and changed the entire process. Changed the entire process. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's important that we regularly collect data, but data should be collected in a process where people who question it are able to, to see the process of data collection. And that process is called scientific methodology. That process should be replicated if need be. And that is why methodology and detailed description of the, of the methodology is very important. If you pick up the agriculture census report, you'll see entire volume dedicated on methodology, description of how the entire sampling framework was reached, how um, uh, the uh, data was collected, and generated, and analyzed. So um, I see that there are other ministries, their representatives are here to discuss 
the 2021 annual agriculture statistics dissemination uh, issues and processes. Rightfully so, because apart from a few countries, the outliers, for example, the oil-rich Middle East countries, etc., the rest of the countries, they've grown on the back of the agriculture sector. And therefore, the entire non-agriculture sector's growth and development is affected by agriculture, is contributed by agriculture sector. So rural maritime development, commerce, industry and trade, all those ministries, all those sectors, their growth and development is contributed by agriculture sector. When agriculture surplus is created, that surplus is transferred to the non-agriculture sector. And there's various uh, you know, um, pathways of the surplus transfer. The farmers, they create the surplus profit, they spend on the supermarkets, they spend on the clothing shops. The farmers, they buy inputs from non-agriculture sector. So this non-agriculture sector, they derive this you know, revenue from the agriculture sector and they reinvest and how, that's how non-agriculture sector grows. So this agriculture census provides a base description of the status of agriculture in Fiji at that particular point in time when the data was collected. We have got about 14% of farmers who, who are women and tells us, tells us that they play a very important and critical role as they have been playing in other sectors, whether that is you know, commerce and trade, whether that is you know, um, fisheries, whether that is uh, law, etc. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I got quite honored to uh, officially open this um, conference here, and uh, we look forward to uh, see how you would work on ensuring that we get people to use this data. This data is available uh, uh, with the Ministry of Agriculture Statistics section, uh, ably led by SAI. We are very fortunate that we've got a very highly uh, competent, qualified and skilled team uh, who could be utilized by other ministries. Uh, probably we can generate some revenue by lending our experts. So um, again, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it's a beginning of a new era where I said to them we need to keep this data by households and come next 10 years time when we do this census and that someone wants to know what had happened to this household, we can pick up in this data that particular household, Jone in Kandavu, and we want to know Jone now how he or she did. Anyone, any farmer, as long as next, next um, uh, census is also uh, I, population data, we could want to know that these are the people who gave, we gave support. Now find out the status then, status now. Remarkable, remarkable policy intervention we can make by such kind of uh, data calls because we took the risk of collecting data from all these households. We would want to know you know, how much surplus have been transferred from agriculture sector, we can use this data to work out. We would want to know how much, which inputs were purchased from different areas, we can use this data to, to find out. So I want to uh, thank you all, and I do hope that you understand the power of data, how powerful data is in terms of uh, assisting um, the country to fulfill its broader vision of uh, generating growth and development and uh, we need to ensure that we take full advantage of the data that you have generated and we use it for, um, for basically uh, positively for growth and development purpose. So I wish you well on your deliberations today and I, I, uh, it gives me great pleasure in officially opening this 2021 annual agriculture statistics dissemination conference. Thank you. Naka.